the committee uh, will come to order uh, at the start of this hearing of the Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, Transnational Crime, Civilian Security, Democracy, Human Rights, and Global Women's Issues uh, will come to order, as I said. This hearing is titled, The Deepening Political and Economic Crisis in Venezuela, Implications for U.S. Interests and the Western Hemisphere. I'd like to begin by welcoming Mr. Alex Lee, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South America and Cuba, and Mr. John E. Smith the Acting Director of Office of Foreign Assets Control. We had invited Assistant Secretary of State Roberta Jacobson to participate. We were informed that uh, she is in Havana today and she'll, she will not be available, so we appreciate you being here, Mr. Lee. So with vast oil reserves, Venezuela is one of the richest countries in Latin America. And the Venezuelan people are intelligent, they're well-educated, they're hard-working people. The evidence of this can be found in my home state in Miami and in Doral and in Weston, Florida, where a vibrant Venezuelan community has helped build quality and vibrant communities. And Venezuela is also the cradle of democracy in South America. And that's why it is so tragic that Venezuela has turned into a social, political, and economic disaster. The reason for this is simple, because today that nation is increasingly in the iron grip of corrupt and incompetent leaders a rich country suffering from a massive and growing shortage of food, medicine, and basic goods to the point where Maduro has had to order supermarkets to install fingerprint scanners to enforce food rations. Venezuela has an inflation rate of over 60% among the highest in the world. Price controls in Venezuela have led to massive shortages of medicine and medical equipment. It's forced hospitals to suspend cancer treatments and all but emergency surgical procedures. Shortages of spare parts have grounded much of the bus and truck fleet, and many airlines have stopped flying to Venezuela altogether. The government, by the way, has also defaulted on several large debts. Back when they were facing elections in 2012 and 13, they authorized more inputs, uh, imports than they could afford. But when the bills came due, they stopped paying them, building up tens of billions of dollars worth of debt. The result is that Venezuelan bonds are treated as among the riskiest in the world, demanding premiums that are twice those of Bolivia, four times those of Nigeria, and 13 times those of Mexico or Chile. It is the incompetence of Nicolás Maduro and his predecessor, Hugo Chávez, that have left Venezuela in the position that it finds itself in. But instead of seeking out reforms to improve these conditions, the response of the Maduro regime has been to crack down on dissent, erode democracy, and violently violate the human rights of their own people. Here's just a brief recap of the steps Maduro and his cronies have taken to strengthen their grip on power. In April of 2013, the main opposition TV network, Global Vision, was forced to sell to a pro-government owner. In July of 2013, pro-government businessmen bought Cadena Capriles, the owner of the largest daily in Venezuela, Ultimas Noticias. In August of 2013, the most corrupt man in Venezuela, and that is one heck of a title, Mr. Diosdado Cabello, the National Assembly President, used a simple majority vote instead of the required two-thirds vote to suspend an opposition deputy from office, paving the way for a series of votes to grant Maduro decree powers. In September of 2013, Maduro closes Voz de Orinoco, a radio station. He closed it for, quote, calling for rebellion, unquote. In October of 2013, Maduro restricts bulk paper imports to opposition newspapers, making it harder for them to go to print. In February of 2014, security officials working with armed pro-government thugs confront, beat, and even kill anti-Maduro protesters. That same month, the National Telecommunications Commission prohibits local TV and radio from covering anti-government protests. In May of 2014, the Maduro government begins to routinely block websites that are critical of the regime. In July of 2014, a Spanish investor group close to Maduro by El Universal, one of the nation's flagship daily newspapers, and immediately the content of that newspaper changes to that one of supportive of Maduro. In August of 2014, the government begins proceedings against Radio Caracas, and it suspends an opposition radio show from broadcasting. This is just a small sampling of the anti-democratic moves and the violent moves taken by this regime just in the last year and a half. Now, faced with these long string of human rights violations and the fact that many of these violators and the people who enable them have strong economic links to the United States, and in particular, South Florida, late last year, Congress passed and the President signed a law 
allowing the United States to deny visas and freeze the assets of human rights violators in Venezuela. And last week, the President applied these sanctions against several human rights violators. These sanctions are not against the government of Venezuela. These sanctions are not against the people of Venezuela, nor do they aim to deny the people of Venezuela anything. These sanctions that the President has imposed deny known human rights violators the chance to use the money they have stolen from the people of Venezuela to enjoy luxuries here in the United States. These sanctions also deny human rights violators the chance to travel freely to the United States. Faced with an economic catastrophe and dwindling public support, Nicolás Maduro has tried to use these sanctions as a way to deflect from these problems and rally people around anti-Americanism and nationalism. He has gone as far as to absurdly claim that the United States is preparing an invasion of Venezuela. And he has tried to place the opposition in a position of either supporting him or being labeled as traitors. So let me be very clear. The future of Venezuela belongs to the people of Venezuela to decide via free and fair elections. The United States has no interest and no plans of imposing or encouraging what direction a free people of Venezuela freely choose. The purpose of these sanctions is only this, to deny corrupt officials and human rights violators the opportunity to buy homes, make investments, and vacation in the United States with the money they have stolen from the people of Venezuela. Nevertheless, we can expect to see more of these theatrics from Nicolás Maduro in the days and weeks to come. In fact, we've just received word that he is shopping around an open letter to the American people to be published any day now in some major American media outlet or various media outlets, encouraging the American people to stand up to their elected officials and ask them to stop picking on him. By the way, in the same letter, he accuses the United States of being involved in a 2002 coup plot in Venezuela, another absurd claim. This past weekend, he asked for and was given absolute power once again by the National Assembly. This grab for power through a, through a decree powers that were given to him. You can expect to see more of this because the declining economy and fail, falling oil prices has cut into his ability to buy support. Unable to find, here's some of the things we can expect to see. Unable to find credible evidence of coup plots between the opposition and U.S. diplomats, I expect and predict that soon you will see them produce fabricated evidence of coup plotting. You will see clandestine assassination of opposition figures. And you may even see Maduro and his cronies try to move up this year's legislative elections to capitalize on this nationalism before the popularity of his government fades even more. But no amount of repression or theatrics will solve or cover up the disaster that he has brought upon the people of Venezuela. Food seized from private stores, rot in warehouses because of their incompetence. Maduro and his cronies continue to manipulate currency to make money for themselves. Maduro and his cronies will continue to force those doing business with the government to use companies they control as subcontractors. And at some point this year, we may even see the gas subsidies long provided by the government, either altered or removed altogether. And we will also continue to see human rights violations. The defense minister, Vladimir Padrino Lopez, has authorized the use of force against peaceful demonstrators, which has led to the murder of a 14-year-old boy. We will see more arrests, like the recent one of the elected mayor of Caracas, Antonio Ledesma, who was arrested last month. And sadly, we will see more deaths, such as one when opposition leader Rodolfo Gonzalez took his own life when faced with the Maduro decision to move the dissident leader to a cell block of common criminals. It is also worth noting some other aspects of this regime. First, the Cuban dictatorship has penetrated every aspect of the Venezuelan government. We will get into that today. Second, Maduro has opened the door to closer military relations with Iran, Russia, and China. In fact, the Venezuelan military is currently conducting exercises with visiting Russian troops and equipment. Third, the Maduro regime continues to harbor vast elements of the FARC within Venezuelan territory, offering this terrorist group sanctuary and protection. And fourth, along with Cuba, Maduro continues to aid populist anti-American elements throughout Central and South America. The people of Venezuela deserve better than this. And while the direction of their future belongs to them, we will be a strong voice in firm support of their aspirations for a better country and a better life. And we will not allow those who are violating their rights and denying them this better future, the chance to come to Doral or Weston or to Miami or Cocoa Plum and enjoy life with the money they have stolen from their own people.
I'll begin the questioning round. Uh, we'll do seven minutes since um, I think we'll have time to get through all this. Let me begin with you, Mr. Lee. I wanted to talk to you about the state, political state in Venezuela. So as I've outlined in my opening statements, and so has the ranking member and the ranking member of the full committee, in Venezuela there's an increased encroachment on freedom of the press and communication. Uh, there's been an increased encroachment on the judiciary branch. It no longer truly operates as an independent branch. We've seen the prosecutorial powers used uh, to not just fabricate evidence, but to target political opponents. We've seen members of the opposition expelled by simple majority votes from the, the National Assembly. Um, we've seen the jailing of virtually every prominent, at some point, of virtually every prominent voice in Venezuela that opposes the Maduro government. And there's now this pattern of decree powers that have been given to Maduro, including the one this weekend. Is Venezuela still a democracy? Venezuela. Can you turn your mic on? I'm sorry. The Venezuelan electoral system um, is actually uh, quite good uh, in terms of the mechanical process. What the government has done is used a variety of means, gerrymandering, massive use of public funds, um, trumped up charges against key opposition people, a systematic uh, undermining of the independence of the media to tilt all uh, the electoral ground in its favor. That still does not change the reality of how Venezuelans view um, the situation in Venezuela or how they perceive the government's handling. And if you look at polling, the polling shows that the majority of Venezuelans view the government mismanaging the economy and things are getting worse. We call on the Venezuelan government to uh, announce elections um, we call on the Venezuelan government to hold those elections in a way that provides a political space for the opposition. Um, and we believe that if that is done, and in particular if the international community can provide electoral monitoring of those elections, the Venezuelan people will have an opportunity to express their views. Well, thank you, Mr. Lee. And I, I appreciate your answer, and I understand that. I would just suggest that we need to view this from a different perspective, because in Latin America, there's a troubling trend, and that is people come to power through an election and then begin to undermine all the apparatus of a free society. So if, a, if I'm a member of the opposition, and there's no free press that can cover my activities, because they're not allowed to operate, so I have no way to get my word out, Maduro has unfettered access to the national airwaves. I have no access to the, federal, to, to the national airwaves. If I speak out too vehemently against him in the National Assembly, I could be removed and arrested. From, first they remove you so they can strip you of the immunity of being an, a member or deputy, and then they arrest you for it. Um, and, and not to mention that there's evidence of electoral fraud in the last elections. You combine all these things, and just because you have an election or say you had an election does not make it a free and fair election. This is the pattern that has been followed in places like Nicaragua and other places as well. There's more to democracy than just holding an election. And certainly they're capable of having a free and fair election mechanically. But when the people running against you can't go on the airwaves, can't have TV shows, can't speak out or they'll be arrested, um, the entire media is owned by your cronies, um, you have unfettered access to the airwaves, they have none, and if you're part of the opposition and you oppose Maduro, you can be arrested. Uh, this is a very, in my mind, that does not sound like a democratic society, and I think it's important for us to understand that this is the new way tyrants are now operating. They, they, they dress themselves up as Democrat, but then they end up governing in much different ways, and that's an important distinction for us to point to. I want to get to the issue of individuals. There's a number of individuals uh, that, were not on the, that were not sanctioned that I would encourage uh, us to continue to look at. For example, last year, Generals uh, Aref Jimenez and Julio Cesar Morales Prieto, who held senior positions in Venezuela's Directorate of Armaments and Explosives, uh, played a key role in their efforts to create and support the government-affiliated colectivos, where, where there was basically are irregular armed groups. Uh, the DAX, by the way, is currently led by General Ignacio Velasquez Ramos. This is a group that's been intricately involved in cracking down on dissent. Uh, there's been seven of the seven designated individuals uh, 
that constitute a national security threat to the United States, their bosses are not represented. For example, General Vladimir Padrino, the Minister of Defense, and as such the highest ranking military officer, uh, has not been held responsible for human rights violations committed by his subordinates. Some of the sanctions were based on Venezuelan officials allegedly involved in corruption and illicit activities, but we didn't include Diosdado Cabello, the head of the parliament, who's been identified by defectors and others as the head of the Cartel de los Soles, a uh, drug, drug cartel operated by Venezuelan generals. And then there's multiple print and broadcast reports, articles, and even books detailing the presence in the United States of Chavez and Maduro government officials that have become flabbiously wealthy from what are alleged to be corrupt activities. They too use our financial system to transfer funds. One example is an individual by the name of Alejandro Andrade, who's a former army lieutenant and a fellow plotter of Chavez in the 1992 attempted coup that cost the lives of over 300 Venezuelans and who was later appointed by Chavez as the treasurer of the country. He is reported to be living in a multi-million dollar equestrian estate in South Florida. And there are many other former officials, bankers and business executives also living or owning property in the U.S that are alleged to have acquired fortunes illicitly, illicitly with the complicity of the Chavez Maduro government. And I would encourage you to look at some of them as well. Uh, Mr. Smith, has the Treasury looked at certain financial institutions in Venezuela or the Venezuelan banking system as a whole to see who might qualify as financial institutions of primary money laundering concern under Section 311 of the U.S. Patriot Act, USA Patriot Act? Uh, Senator, I can tell you that with respect to many of the names that you talked about, we continue to investigate vigorously um, under all of the prongs of the executive order. Unfortunately, you're asking me about uh, authority, uh, the particular one with respect to the financial institution. You're asking me about an authority that is administered by one of my sister agencies, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and I can take that question back to them. Well, let me just encourage you to act on information my office has received. Uh, into money laundering carried out by the petroleum company, PDVSA, PDVSA. There are close ties, according to these allegations and information that I've received, between this organization and money laundering and drug trafficking activity. And there are a number of names that have been forwarded to us as individuals involved in this illicit activity. Rafael Ramirez, Nervis Gerardo Villalobos, Omar Farias, Carlos Luis, Aguilera Borjas, Alcides Rondon, and Rafael Jimenez Villarroel. Uh, we've received significant information about their ties uh, between the state-run oil entity and drug trafficking and other laundering activities within Venezuela. So let me, uh, Mr. Lee, just touch on the issue of human rights. They've been well documented. We know some of them have already happened. I want to inform you of a couple more that I hope the, the State Department will look at closely as we continue to examine other people that can be sanctioned. The first is, have you been made aware of a facility that's colloquially referred to as La Tumba, the tomb? Have you heard that term? No, sir. Okay, well, let me tell you about it based on the information we've received. It's a detention area that's located four stories below the Plaza Venezuela, which is, seven which is a seven station where detainees are held captive in two to three meter sized rooms. They're subjected to minimum temperatures and permanent neon lighting and denied sunlight so that they can become disoriented and suffer physical and psychological deterioration. We've also received information that Gabriel Valles, Gerardo Carrero, and Lorenz Sale have been held captive in that facility and are subjected to this torture. That the purpose of this treatment is to coerce from them false testimony against members of the opposition. I also want to make you aware of the circumstances surrounding the death of Rodolfo Gonzalez. Uh, the information we've received, that obviously he was an opposition activist, a senior citizen, and he was jailed in a seven facility beginning in April of 2014, supposedly for conspiring against the government, which was actually false. Uh, he, during this time, he was visited by Iris Varela, who was the minister of the national prison system, uh, days before his apparent suicide while in custody. And according to the information we have received, Varela threatened to transfer him to a general population prison, basically with other common criminals, with common criminals, not other common criminals. Uh, he was instructed uh, to gather his personal belongings, and he was even taken to a prison medic for an examination prior to this transfer. According to the information provided to us, Mr. Gonzalez's lawyer has confirmed that he was visited by one of the individuals that is sanctioned, that's a prosecutor, Catherine Harrington, who offered to improve the conditions of his detention in exchange for testimony which would incriminate Antonio Ledesma in a conspiracy against the government. So these are just two recent pieces of information we've been made aware of uh, just in the last few days.
that call to light the sort of human rights violations that are occurring in Venezuela. And I would encourage the State Department uh, to take seriously as, as this information comes in, because it gives us more and more people that we can look at for sanctions, and also to shame them publicly. These are inf one day we're going to have freedom in Venezuela. There'll be a, a functional government again, and hopefully a better future for Venezuelan people. And these individuals responsible for the human rights abuses are going to have to be accountable for what they're doing. So that is why it's so critical that these human rights abuses be documented now, so that in the future these individuals will be held to account for the crimes they're committing against the people of Venezuela. Uh, before I dismiss this panel, and I appreciate your time and your patience indulging us here with these votes that are coming in, Mr. Smith, I wanted to touch upon a couple issues with you in regards to the nature of this regime. So Ambassador Brownfield, the Assistant Secretary, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, has been quoted as saying in that uh, recent media reports about the Venezuelan government's complicity with cartels were not inconsistent with the evidence um, with regards to, to their work uh, in drug trafficking. And I wanted to share with, with you something that I hope we'll continue to look at. Actually, this is for both of you that I hope you'll continue to look at. There's a, a law enforcement advisory that went out in February of this year. And I want to read from it, but ba or paraphrase from it, but basically, it said that uh, there's reporting that indicates that government officials in Venezuela coordinate flights carrying bulk cash to the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad, that the source of these funds include funds that are donated by the Venezuelan Arab expatriate community, but the bulk of the cash includes money that Venezuelan officials collect through the trafficking of drugs and exacting bribes from other drug traffickers uh, who land cash-laden planes in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. This, by the way, is part of a longer-standing Venezuelan support of the Assad regime, as, as was reported back in 2012. Uh, the state-owned company, Petróleos de Venezuela, PDVSA, PDVSA, uh, that was discovered that there were tankers in Syrian ports. This was discovered and disclosed, by the way, by an economic research firm that tracks maritime satellite data. What, what do we know? Or what any, any of you tell us about the links between the, the Maduro regime and the government of Syria under Assad. Do we have any information on that you could share? I don't have any information I can share. We've been tracking the, um, the disturbing activities of members of the government of Venezuela, and we've linked them publicly to narco trafficking activities. Um, and we have also linked them to other, other disturbing activities that we've been able to highlight in a variety of regimes we have not designated pursuant to our Syria authorities. Well, this information, again, is produced by U.S. law enforcement agencies. They're obviously available to you. I would encourage you to look at them as we move forward. These are important pieces of information that we shouldn't be ignoring and should certainly figure into our calculus. There is also links to Iran and Venezuela. My office has received reports that there is a collusion between the Maduro regime and, the Ar and Argentina regarding operation that could facilitate a transaction with Iran that would violate UN stipulations. Do you have any information uh, on Venezuela providing Argentina with licit or illicit financial incentives in exchange for procuring Argentinian support towards this help towards Iran evading sanctions? We are aware of those uh, press reports um, and reports, uh, but I have nothing to add to it to the moment. Okay. Well, there's a report by the Washington, D.C.-based Center for, Secure F for a Secure Free Society and from Canada's Institute for Social and Economic Analysis, which raises concerns about the use of Venezuela as a bridge to smuggle Iranian agents into North America. It states that Venezuelan authorities provided at least 173 passports visas and other documentation controlled by Cuba state-owned Albet to Islamist extremists seeking to slip unnoticed into North America. Have you followed up on those reports? Uh, I, I have not. There may be others uh, who have, um, but I'm not in a position to comment on it. Senator, I would just add that we have sanctions investigators that work across our sanctions programs, including Iran, um, Syria, narco trafficking, and now Venezuela, and they follow up on all of the law enforcement and intelligence reporting to try to build cases where they can.
Okay. Now I want to go through Venezuela's connection to Cuba. According to high-level military defectors from Venezuela's government, there are between 2,700 and 3,000 Cuban intelligence agents in the South American nation embedded in sectors such as the military, agriculture, finance, and petroleum refinery. According to high-level military defectors from Venezuela's government, the Cubans have modernized Venezuela's intelligence services, both the SEBIN, which is the Boliv Bolivarian National Intelligence Service, that reports directly to the president and also military intelligence. They've also set up a special unit to protect Nicolas Maduro. Last year, former Venezuelan intelligence agents and sources with direct access to active officers of the Bolivar Bolivarian Armed Forces told El Nuevo Herald newspaper that Cuba plays a leading role in the repression unleashed by Maduro against Venezuelan protesters. The Cubans are in charge of operations which range from security around the presidential palace to planning of arrests of opponents. These Venezuelan sources told El Nuevo Herald that Cubans have planned the operations of between 600 and 1,000 armed, armed men who comprise the Chavista paramilitary group known as the Colectivos. In 2007, Juan Jose Ravilero, head of Cuba's Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, the CDR, very similar to the Colectivos, claimed that there were over 30,000 members of Cuba's Committee for the Defense of the Revolution in Venezuela. According to investigations by independent Venezuelan journalists, the Cubans have computerized Venezuela's public records, giving them control over the issue of identity papers and voter registration. The Cubans have representatives in the ports and airports and have taken part in the purchases of military equipment. A state-owned Cuban company, Albet Ingeniería y Sistemas, received $170 million to develop electronic data systems in Venezuela. Through Albet, the Cuban government has been given access to Venezuelan databases from which it could modify and even issue documents to citizens of other countries. Its portfolio includes the Maduro Communications Office and operating systems for prisons, emergency services, hospitals, and police. Are you aware of the links between Venezuela and Cuba that go as deep as what I've just outlined? And if so, uh, what have we done or are doing to continue to monitor that and call attention to it? Senator, the, the links between Cuba and Venezuela and the links between Cuba and Venezuela's intelligence services uh, and military and a variety of other social missions um, is well known. Um, many of the things that you have said uh, I am very familiar with. Some of them uh, I, I am not. Um, but the fundamental reality that there's a close uh, relationship between both countries is very evident. Well, let me ask you this. Is, you would agree that the Venezuelan government under Maduro is repressing its own people, right? Yes. You would agree that the Cubans are helping the Venezuelans in putting in place the systems of repression? I think that the kind of advice the Cubans uh, provide um, is not necessarily the most democratic. Well, what does that mean? The, are the Cubans helping the Venezuelans repress their own people? Are the Cubans assisting the colectivos, the, these armed groups of not irregular groups on the ground that are used to confront protesters and, and other such activity? Uh, I am personally not aware of a link between the Cubans and the colectivos. Uh, I am aware of the link between the colectivos and the use of, by the Maduro government of the colectivos uh, to uh, um, repress uh, peaceful demonstrators. I think that is very clear. Okay. Are you aware that the Cubans are intricately involved in issuing documents in Venezuela, such as uh, voter registration, passports, and not just to Venezuelans, but to, to non-citizens of Venezuela as well? Would you acknowledge that that's happening? I would ha um, I am aware of some levels of cooperation that you're talking about. Uh, Mr. Lee, is Venezuela in your portfolio? What you Yes, it is, sir. And the Cubans, everyone in Venezuela, in fact, anyone who looks at it realizes the Cubans are crawling all over the place in Venezuela. There are tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Cubans all over the country and, and embedded in every sector of the government. I mean, anyone who comes back from Venezuela tells you that repeatedly. 
How can this be part of your portfolio and you not be aware of the enormous Cuban presence that exists in Venezuela? Senator, I did not deny that Cuba has an outsized influence in Venezuela. Um, it is clear that they have a long-standing and deep relationship in a variety of areas, including uh, in the intelligence services, including in the military, including a wide variety of government agencies that we're perfectly aware of. So if you acknowledge that they have an outsized influence and they're involved in intelligence and security agencies, why is it, why can I not, why can you not just state today what everyone knows, and that is that the Cuban government is actively assisting the Venezuelan government in suppressing its people? That's what the Cubans are expert at in Venezuela. What else could they be contributing to the effort? That is what they're best known for on the island. That's, that's what they have most uh, established expertise at doing to their own people in Cuba. So you have a repressive regime in Cuba that for over 55 years has actively repressed its own people and, and, and cut down on all sorts of uh, activity on the island. They are, have an outsized influence in Venezuela. They have an outsized influence in both its intelligence gathering and its uh, security agencies. Why is it not a logical thing? Even if you didn't have specific facts, which I'm sure you do, but even if we did not have it, why, is it not a, why isn't it not a reasonable assumption that the Cubans are actively assisting the Venezuelan government in suppressing the people of Venezuela? The fundamental um, responsibility for um, what happens in Venezuela is the Venezuelan government. Um, that the Venezuelan, and really, if we're going to focus on where the blame is, it should be for the Venezuelan's government's own actions against its own people. Um, and I think uh, we, we need to focus on holding the Venezuelan government responsible for its actions. No one disputes that, Mr. Lee, but the question is not whether the Venezuelans are ultimately responsible. Ultimately, they're the ones that ask for the assistance and are putting it into place. The question is whether the Cubans are assisting the Venezuelan government in putting in place the mechanisms that the Venezuelan government is using to repress the people of Venezuela. You cannot answer that question today? I think the Venezuelan government um, charts its own course, takes advice from the Cubans on certain things, but fundamentally it's the Venezuelan government that charts its own course um, for good, for ill, uh, whether effectively or feckless. Okay, well, Mr. Lee, I think what's obvious here is that you can't say what everyone knows, and that is that the Cuban government is helping the Venezuelan government do this, because on the one hand, while we're sanctioning Venezuelan government officials, we are lifting sanctions on Cuban officials that have made this possible. And so, at the end of the day, it, it truly is amazing to me that in this hearing, the individual responsible for this portfolio on behalf of the U.S. government refuses to state on the record that the Cuban government is intricately involved in helping the Venezuelan government to, to repress its own people. This is a claim we've been willing to make about multiple countries around the world. This is a claim we've made about the Cubans in the past. This is a claim that we've made about the Cubans and, the, and that the State Department has acknowledged up until December of last year, uh, when suddenly they stopped talking about it. I just find it unbelievable that we cannot get somebody from the Department of State who is responsible for this portfolio to openly acknowledge that the Cuban government is providing extraordinary assistance to the Venezuelan government in suppressing the people of Cuba and the, suppressing the people of Venezuela. And, and I, I hope that you'll reconsider, I hope the State Department will reconsider acknowledging that because it, is every, it, it undermines our credibility as a nation to turn a blind eye to the role that the Cuban government is playing in the suppression of the Venezuelan people. The people of Venezuela are fully aware of it. There isn't anyone that gets off a plane from Venezuela that doesn't tell you there are Cubans everywhere. And there are Cubans everywhere on the island involving governmental functions. Multiple people from Venezuela will tell you that when you go get a passport or any document, it is oftentimes a Cuban behind the counter that is coordinating it all. And to somehow think they're there as a benign force for purposes of providing moral support is quite frankly absurd. And so I hope that you'll reconsider your answer in the days to come because it is clear to everyone who knows anything about this and you know a lot about this, that the Cubans are helping the Venezuelans carry out these, these uh, operations that they're, that, they're, that they're taking against their own people. Thank you all three for being here. Let me start with you, Dr. Sabatini. I wanted to ask you why you have shared in your testimony something that Senator Boxer brought up earlier, and that is the silence of communities in, in Latin America and in the Western Hemisphere to what's happening in Venezuela. You, you compared it to the Honduran case that occured back in 2009, if I'm correct. And, um, and, and how that was met. 
Why, in your mind, is such, why, why the silence from virtually everyone in the hemisphere, with the exception of President Santos, who condemned a specific arrest? But why the silence? It's a good question, Senator. I have several theories. Uh, I think first, there, is, uh, there has occurred in the last 10 years a proliferation of new regional organizations led primarily by Brazil. There's a South American Union, UNASUR, then there's the uh, Latin American Caribbean Union, CELAC. Um, all, both of those are intended to sort of marginalize the United States from those discussions, uh, and not to wax too, <laughs> too academic here, but those institutions actually lack a fundamental element of a multilateral institution. They do not ask their member countries to surrender any part of their sovereignty for a larger collective good. If you look at their founding documents, if you look at their statements, they always talk about how national sovereignty is supreme. So I actually think that we have gone backwards in the region. We talk about popular sovereignty. We're back to the point when Latin American countries assert this principle of non-intervention, which can have very dangerous consequences. Because those, that principle of popular sovereignty evolved after World War II to protect the horrendous things that happened in Nazi Germany. So I think, first of all, there's been actually a philosophical institutional shift within the region. Second, I think that the region is simply does not want to have the United States involved, is actively seeking to marginalize to do that. Um, to give an example and to refer to what was said earlier about the need for election observation, be very careful. UNASUR's election observation program explicitly says that they are there to accompany, to accompany the electoral commission, which if your electoral commission is vitiated or politicized means you're just going there as a rubber stamp. So it's very important who monitors those elections. And on the last point, there is certainly a level of, of, of ideological sympathy and affinity with a number of these governments with the Chavez, which is a shame. Because while I believe Dilma Rousseff and the PT may be a genuinely leftist, even social democratic government, basically Venezuela is a military government led by a group of thugs. But unfortunately, they cannot make that distinction. And one last point, there are also very tight economic relations between Brazil benefits deeply from agricultural exports, um, investment in infrastructure, and other things that sort of have made it very, very difficult to break its ties with Venezuela. Dr. Sabatini, you also talked and touched upon the drug trade. And as we know, if you watch the flights that come out of Colombia and South America and inner Central America and ultimately are transited into the United States, many of them overfly Venezuela. It is hard to believe that those flights are occurring without the knowledge of someone in Venezuela. In fact, the allegations and some of the proof is very clear that the Venezuelan government actually allows these flights to pay for protection money in exchange for being able to use airspace in Venezuela. If you don't pay the protection money, you may be shot down. If you pay the protection money to either a corrupt individual or to the Maduro government, you can overfly that, that airspace. Is that an accurate assessment of the role Venezuela is playing in the drug trade? It's a very accurate assessment. If we look at a map, uh, basically Venezuela is crosshatched by flights that are coming from Colombia or leaving from Venezuela, mostly to go to West Africa, but now increasingly going to the Caribbean. Again, raising, raising the two points. One is why Venezuela is, as you say, uh, since it is so closely tied to the drug trade at a state level, and particularly at a military level, um, why this is a security risk to the region. And so Brazil and other countries ignore what's going on at their own peril. They will be most affected. And it, not coincidentally, one of the highest per capita consumers of cocaine today is Brazil. Mr. Cantone, you described a Venezuela where there's no freedom of expression, where there is no freedom of assembly and association, where there's a lack of any sort of judicial independence, where there's arrests and detentions of opponents of the government, where there's degrading and cruel treatment of those opponents when imprisoned. Um, so going deeper than that, we know that if you're a member of the opposition, you have virtually no access to the airwaves, no independent press. They're denied things like bulk paper imports so they can't even print. Uh, you're forced to sell to owners that are friendly to the regime. Uh, just a moment ago, I struggled to get the Department of State of the United States to acknowledge that Venezuela was no longer a democracy. In essence, democracy is more than just elections. Why should I continue to consider what they have in Venezuela today as a democracy, given the fact that all of the, the beyond having an election, which may or may not be even valid in some cases because of, of manipulation of the ballot, all the other underlying conditions of a democracy are not present. In essence, there cannot be a democracy unless both sides have free and fair access to the people who vote. Why should I Is Venezuela still a democracy? That's an you know, excellent question. It's more academic than practical to some extent. I, Maduro is 
president elected by the popular vote. Uh, nobody can argue against that. Maybe someone can argue that the elections were not free and fair. Uh, that's a possibility because he won only for 1.5. 1. Uh, 1. 1. 1. Um, but uh, he was selected by the popular vote. All the other conditions of democracy are not there. I completely agree with you on that aspect. There's no independence of the judiciary. The legislation is just a rubber stamp uh, institution, and there is constantly uh, violations of human rights in the country. So let me, I'm sorry to rephrase, let me rephrase my question this way, um, and I get your point. Let's assume, and I don't, I don't accept this, but let's assume that the election was free and fair. Right. Is, is Nicolás Maduro today governing Venezuela as a Democrat? No. Absolutely not, uh, and rather than using the word democracy that can give uh, uh, space for uh, ambiguity, I would say there is absolutely no rule of law in Venezuela. So formally, on paper and institutionally, Venezuela has a democratic form of government in how it's being governed today. It is no longer being governed as the democracy. Correct. Okay. Um, and then, Mr. Farrar, I wanted to talk to you about the national security aspects of this. Actually, before I go to you, let me just finish this with Mr. Cantonga. I know you didn't get to it or couldn't get to it in your written statement because of the limits amount of time. Can you briefly describe, uh, as, you written your, as you wrote in your testimony, the conditions that Leopoldo Lopez now faces in captivity? I mean, the, everybody in jail, everybody in, jail in, in Venezuela is in a very, very uh, serious uh, situation and very grave situation on the personal integrity and right to life. Is he in solitary confinement? He's in solitary confinement, and only a few weeks ago, there was an attempt to get into his cell by a, bang, by a gang of facts in, in the prison. Uh, nothing unfortunately happened. Uh, but nothing fortunately happened. I spoke with uh, Leopoldo's mother only a week ago. He's in okay condition, but uh, he's, by being in a jail in Venezuela, Everybody, and particularly if you are Leopoldo Lopez, your life is at risk. Is he allowed visits from his family on a regular basis? Not on a very regular basis. Uh, her mother can visit him once in a while as well as his wife, but it's not very regular. Okay. Mr. Farrar, I wanted to talk about the national security components. First of all, I think it's important at the outset to point to something that you did, and that is that throughout the 1970s until 1993, Argentina had a robust nuclear relationship with Iran and that the current Iranian reactors were retrofitted and upgraded with Argentine nuclear technology. Is that, that's accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you describe the nexus that exists today in your mind between Argentina, Iran, and Venezuela? Well, I think that uh, Iran desperately wants to get its nuclear program up and running, and it was until the 1994 AMIA bombing, there was a very close uh, exchange program between Iranian scientists and Argentinian scientists, etc. Uh, Prosecutor Niesman identified the cutting off of that uh, relationship under U.S. and European pressure in 1993 is the trigger factor that set off the AMIA bombing in Buenos Aires in, in 1994. So when Iran needed to get back in the game or wanted desperately to get back into the game. They approached Venezuela, Hugo Chavez specifically, with Nestor Kirchner, uh, the, Christina's husband and, and predecessor, to begin opening uh, the dialogue. As, Veja, as the recent Veja investigation shows, uh, President Chavez said immediately, yes, let me do this, get on it. Uh, Nestor Kirchner was not particularly interested. In 2009 with Christina, they revisited it. And they has, there was a steady flow, or there has been a steady flow, of Argentine scientists, nuclear uh, folks going to uh, Venezuela. Uh, my understanding from talking to people very familiar with Argentina's nuclear program is that Iran has been interested in trying to recruit the entire uh, team of scientists. They don't want it ones or twos. They want an entire team, and they're simply not willing to go. Uh, so that hasn't happened yet. But I think Venezuela it was the necessary bridge to bring the uh, Fernández de Kirchner government into contact with Iran and then you had the whole uh, ongoing scandal with the memorandum of understanding and other things that happened in Argentina as a result of that uh, growing uh, closeness. And ultimately, you have uh, pre uh, Prosecutor Niesman's uh, accusation that the President, uh, President Kirchner and her foreign minister and others had uh, illegally agreed to, with Iran to get uh, the Interpol red notices dropped against senior Iranian officials in exchange for oil 
et cetera. Um, and you end up with, uh, with Prosecutor Niesman uh, dead. But I think that in that entire process, the, the main interlocutor, the bridge between Iran and Argentina has been and was very active with Venezuela, particularly uh, President Chavez while he was alive and ongoing with President Maduro. Okay, so we've established that there's a nexus there. Let me ask you about this group called the FARC, which is largely operational within Colombia. This is a drug trafficking narco guerrilla group currently engaged in, peaceful, uh, in peace negotiations with the Colombian government, but they do things like extortion and kidnapping and bombings and, and so forth as, in addition to their narco trafficking activities, correct? Yes, sir. They are one of uh, three uh, organizations that's both designated as a major drug trafficking organization and a terrorist organization by the U.S. government. So the FARC is, uh, is treated by the United States government as both a terrorist organization and a narco trafficking organization. Are they not present in Venezuela? Do they not have a presence in Venezuela today? And if so, what is the nature of it? Uh, they have a significant presence. I think that uh, it captured FARC documents beginning in 2008 with the death of Raul Reyes, a FARC commander that was, who was killed in Ecuador. We got about uh, 600 gigabytes of data for the first time on the internal FARC communications. And what was shocking in that, I, I worked with both the Colombian government and, and others on analyzing a chunk of those documents. And what was uh, really eye-opening was the intense level of senior contact between the FARC secretariat, the general secretariat, and not only President Chavez directly, but his entire cabinet, including Diosdado Cabello, Maduro, and all the others who are still there, and his very, the very intense relationship at the same level with the Ecuadorian government of uh, Rafael Correa. That was, those were the two sort of really significant findings, but we, you see there that uh, the Venezuelan government not only gave them shelter, it offered to set up joint businesses with them, it helped finance many of their activities, it carried their political water for them as far as uh, trying to set up uh, these different front groups. It hosted their main front group, which is the Bolivarian, the, um, uh, the CCB, the uh, Santa Continental Bolivariana. Uh, it, and the founding documents are in the FARC documents that were captured, where the FARC complains that no one knows that this front group is a FARC group, but they describe how it was founded in the basement of the presidential palace with President Chavez, you know, personally present. So it's a very, very organic link. It, it goes to the highest levels, and there's nothing non-state about that relationship. It is a, the FARC is viewed, much like Iran views Hezbollah, as a matter of state policy, as a non-state actor that responds directly to them. Okay. What about the links between Venezuela and Hezbollah? I think that you've seen over time something that was initially largely dismissed uh, thanks to the D uh, Drug Enforcement Administration and, their pub and the cases that have become public over the last few years. You see a very, very tight link. Uh, you have uh, Ayman Juma and other very specific cases where the uh, Hezbollah operatives were buying cocaine from the FARC and much of that money is ending up back places like the Lebanese Canadian Bank that have since been closed because the, that money was detected and it's often not as direct a link as people I discuss with in the, in the policy world would like to see, but, it's, but the money, in my mind, they said, well, are they, are they card-carrying Hezbollah people that are buying the cocaine? Who cares? The money ends up in Hezbollah accounts back in Lebanon. Does it really matter whether the person who brokered that deal with the FARC has an ID card that says FARC or whether he's sympathetic enough to move that money back to Hezbollah? I don't think, in my mind, it's, uh, it, there's no distinction necessary there. But it becomes a very uh, intense policy debate within this administration over what constitutes Hezbollah. My argument is that you simply need to look where the money ends up and who, it was, who the benefited from it, and it doesn't matter who the, intermediary, who the intermediaries were and identified specifically as that group. And my last question is about the state-owned company, PDVSA, Petróleos de Venezuela. How does the Venezuelan government under Maduro, the, Vene the Maduro regime, use PDVSA as a source of influence, activity, laundering, et cetera? How is that entity used both in the region and around the world? Well, I think the, the Andorra, uh, the Bank of Andorra findings are uh, extraordinarily important because I've been hearing for the last three or four years that Andorra was where PDVSA had, si had siphoned its money into. They have incredibly uh, tough bank secrecy laws and nothing had come out for a significant period of time. I think that PDVSA has become sort of the piggy bank that no longer has much uh, cash in it. But what you see is an architecture created around the region, particularly with Maduro's allies in, uh, in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, and uh, Salvador Sanchez Seren, and, and the, the remnants of the Communist Party in El Salvador, where you have architectures built up in which no oil is actually moved, but which they use to launder hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And simply looking at the, the financials of those companies, uh, they're absurd. There's, there are no, or almost no legal imports coming in. For example, uh, 
Alba Petróleos in El Salvador began with $1 million as this joint state enterprise with PDVSA owning 60% of the company and, and Alba Petróleos owning 40. They had $1 million in 2007. Their earning statement for 2013 was $863 million with no visible means of, in, uh, with no visible uh, legitimate imports. That's a rather significant increase in your, in your earnings. Daniel Ortega has said publicly that he gets $500 million a year from PDVSA essentially as a personal slush fund. So I think that, uh, and they set up with that an architecture which allows the FARC, the Sinaloa cartel, uh, Hezbollah, many other groups to launder money through the architecture that PDVSA has established. Okay. Um, my last question has, well, let me just ask you one more. And I alluded to this earlier law enforcement report about the use of, uh, of shipments from Venezuela to Syria to, uh, to send bulk cash, uh, both cash raised from the Arab expatriate community, but also cash collected through trafficking of drugs and exacting bribes from um, drug traffickers, and that money being sent to Assad. Uh, are you aware of that report? Are you aware of those allegations? And, and if not, would that surprise you, knowing the nature of the regime? I have heard the allegations. I, don't, I have not seen documentation on it. Uh, I think that given the fact that when uh, Chavez was most active in his direct engagement with Iran, the, the direct flight they set up went from uh, Caracas to Damascus to Tehran back to uh, back to Caracas, it's clear that there's a very strong link. If you look at the literature, Chavez had a very uh, robust relationship with Assad. Uh, that has not changed. The Maduro doesn't have the money, but clearly he has the carrying on the same commitments that Chavez in, entered into. And I think that we have seen numerous cases of massive amounts of bulk cash being shipped back, usually on Iranian ships, which are untraceable once they get to Iran. And with that, some of that money would end up with Assad is not remotely... Uh, is there still a direct flight between Caracas and Tehran? No, sir. That ended in 2011. Okay. So um, my last question, and I don't know who to direct this to, but any of you feel free to ask. I asked at the, at the end of the last panel about the, Cuba's influence, and it's been in Venezuela, or is its presence in Venezuela. And while I was able to get admission that there is an outsized influence, I could not get them to admit that the Cubans were actually involved in, um, in directing or helping the Venezuela regime, the Maduro regime, oppress their own people. So let me just ask all of you to comment on both the, the size, the scope of the Cuban presence in Venezuela. I hear from Venezuelans that are traveling back and, and others uh, that it's an extraordinary presence, that you cannot miss it. And secondly, the nature of that, to the extent you're able to comment. And I guess, Dr. Sabatino, if you have anything to add to that. I'll start first. Uh, it is real. Um, it is, and I'm going to tell perhaps an anecdote which uh, illustrates it. Um, I have a regular uh, annual dinner with uh, Cubans in the UN mission, um, who, as we all know, are spies. And one time, uh, I was sort of chiding them a little bit, saying it must be difficult to be a client state of Venezuela because they're so incompetent. And you know, they, they of course took umbrage at the being called a client state. Um, but and I said, and they, they pushed back, and I said, but yeah, but they, they can't manage it. You guys are real professionals. You're good spies. You do things very well. And there's a long pause, and finally, literally, they said, yes, but we're training them which I think is precisely the point. Um, they are training, they are deeply embedded in the intelligence services, they're deeply embedded in the foreign ministry. Um, I love that they often talk about their sharing uh, sports trainers. I don't know what sports trainers are, um, but it, clearly that's a euphemism for something else that's being, that's there. And of course they also have the medical doctors, which by the way helps underwrite the Cuban pharmaceutical industry. When I was recently on a trip to Cuba, something I had never thought of is the doctors that are being sent to Venezuela are writing prescriptions uh, for, for Cuban drugs that are then shipped. So it sort of also benefits the, the, bio, the pharmaceutical industry in Cuba. It's real, um, and, and, it's, uh, and as I say, I have a, a, a first-hand account that it's, they're there to train and they're there to uh, advise. I, I agree, it is real. In the particular case of the Inter-American System of Human Rights, the information I had when I was at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights was that uh, all the movement of uh, Venezuela to withdraw from the inter-American system of human rights was uh, orchestrated by Cuba. Uh, and that uh, over the last uh, two years, as you know, uh, Venezuela left the inter-American system for the protection of human rights, and that was because Cuba initiated all the process. 
I would just add one thing. I, I agree with both my colleagues. Um, one of the things that the Cubans br were brought in to do, and you see it not only in Venezuela, but certainly in Bolivia and Ecuador, perhaps more pronounced because they're smaller societies, is that in those countries, and I grew up in Bolivia, if you were s someone of uh, stature and you got arrested, you had a social network that would get you out of prison. I never worried during the military dictatorships in Bolivia. If I was picked up, I was going to school with the sons of colonels. There was a social network that would get those people out. The Cubans were brought in to break that social network. They don't care who your uncle went to school with. They don't care who you went to class with. They don't care about any of that. And that has facilitated, in all three of these countries, the ability to throw people like Leopoldo Lopez in prison with no social network that can mobilize to get them out. The Cubans were brought in to essentially slice through those existing sort of safety net cords that had survived through the dictatorships and helped a lot of people uh, in, get sanctuary uh, because they, they are beholden to no one, and they know it, and they can just tell you to walk, you know, walk away and that's it. So it's a very important function they play besides, as, as was pointed out, being incredibly active at the very senior levels. Well, I guess I ask all these questions because while a lot of people were taken aback by the language of the president's announcement last week that Venezuela poses a national security threat, perhaps a better way to phrase it, and I understand they're constrained by bureaucratic necessities, but is not that Venezuela poses a threat per se. The people of Venezuela have no animosity towards the United States, at least the vast majority, the enormous and overwhelming majority and certainly don't pose a threat to the country. But the Maduro regime, as has been described here today, is an anti-American one, is a serial human rights violator, is one that governs undemocratically. Um, it's one that is helping uh, through, it has, and, and may continue to be helping Iran try to evade uh, international sanctions and advance its nuclear program. It's one that's involved in uh, aiding uh, both a terrorist and narco group called the FARC by giving them safe haven and support within their own territory. It's one that's involved, by the way, in, in openly providing safe passage for drug traffickers, for drugs that are ultimately destined for the United States. It's one that actively supports financially Hezbollah. And it's one that uses its state-owned enterprise to foment and support uh, anti-American governments in the region. Uh, and last but not least, it's one that's completely infected by a foreign government uh, that has flooded it with sports trainers, or is or more accurately known as uh, spies and uh, agents of repression that allow it to crack down on its own people and also further the interest of that country over that of the people of Venezuela. That sounds like the Maduro regime is not an insignificant threat to the national security of the United States when you view it in this context. This is not just a nation that is failing economically because of incompetent leaders, and it is certainly that, but it is also one in the grips of a regime that actively supports global terrorism, that actively supports one of the most dangerous developments of the last 20 years, which is Iran's nuclear ambition, that actively supports a group that's both a narco-terrorism group and also an, a, just a flat-out terrorist group. It's one that, uh, that, that uh, and that one that represses its own people brutally with the assistance of the Cuban government. This does not sound to me like something that should be taken lightly, despite the fact that it doesn't receive the attention it deserves. It does sound like, not Venezuela, but the Maduro regime poses a real national security risk, not just to the United States, but to the region. Would anyone disagree with that assessment or elaborate on it? I, I, I agree. Uh, <clears throat> but the issue is how to address that, that, that problem. And uh, I believe uh, the U it's better if the U.S. acts together with the other countries of the region, with o the OAS, with UNASUR, that acting alone. I mean, agreement that we were discussing with Chris this before, I mean, agreement with the sanctions. But it's important for the U.S. to have a very active diplomacy with the OAS and UNASUR. Over the last uh, next few months, there are very important issues happening in the region. There is a new change of the Secretary General of the OAS. The last Secretary General, Jose Miguel Insulza, failed during 10 years. You know, the, his, his tenure at the OAS is the same time of the, 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 the weakness of uh, the, the, the you know, destruction of uh, democracy in Venezuela. There is the Summit of the Americas in just a couple of weeks, and there is the election internally in Venezuela. So I think it is important for the U.S. to work together with the other countries of the region. I know it's not easy. I know this is not the best timing, but it's the best way to approach the situation in Venezuela. And Mr. Canton, I would not disagree. I would love nothing more than to see the nations of the region condemn what's happening in Venezuela. I would love to see nothing more than at, than at least one country, at least one come forward and say what's going on in Venezuela is outrageous and as a neighboring country we're outraged by it.
the problem is that we haven't seen any of that occur. And in the interim, U.S. national security is at stake. And so, in, in fact, as, as Senator Menendez pointed earlier, a few, about a year ago, the administration did not want to do sanctions because they wanted to give time for this UNISOR process to work. And the problem with that process, of course, was that they went in and basically treated both sides as moral equals when they were not. One side was unarmed civilians protesting conditions in Venezuela, and the other side were armed with sticks and clubs and guns and were beating them, and they also happened to have the power of government on their side. And uh, so while I agree with you and I share with you the hope that we would be joined by other nations, uh, recent history doesn't hold much hope that that's going to happen, and I think it's to the great shame of the nations in this hemisphere who stand by silently and are watching this happen. Anyone else care to elaborate on um, what, my statement a moment I, ago? I would, I would fully agree, and I, I wrote a paper that the Army War College published in 2012 saying that the criminalized states of Latin America should be considered a tier one national security threat. And I think that that has been, because not only, as I said in my testimony, not only in Venezuela, it's a network of countries now acting in concert with extra-regional actors, with the primary unifying factor in all of their ideologies is a hatred for the United States and a firm belief in their public doctrine that the use of WMD against the United States is acceptable military doctrine and necessary military doctrine. I think, because we don't take people seriously when they tell us what they want to do, that that's a serious oversight on our part and that as they move forward, that strategic goal on their end has not changed. I'll just add quickly, I agree with you, and for so long uh, this administration, uh, which I support, has first talked about the, the, the new era of partnership in the hemisphere. The truth is partners don't treat partners like Brazil and others are treating us. Uh, they don't denounce uh, perhaps, perhaps inflammatory language, but an action that, in fact, uh, they embraced uh, only a few years earlier when it came to Honduras. I think we need to find who our allies are in the region and work with them carefully to find a comfort zone where they can start to engage in this. Because I agree with you, Venezuela is a national security threat, probably more to the region than it is the United States, which makes it all the more ironic that they're the ones who are criticizing us for saying it. Well, I appreciate your insights today. I think, if anything, this hearing, I hope, will remind my colleagues and the American people about what we're facing in our own hemisphere. Number one is just an astronomical level of human rights abuses and an erosion of democracy, which, by the way, is not only contained to Venezuela. You find that erosion of democracy in Bolivia and in Ecuador and in Nicaragua, and certainly the total absence of it in Cuba. Um, it's one of those startling new developments we've seen after 20 years of democratic progress where people come to power through an election and then immediately undermine all of the institutions necessary for a vibrant democracy. It's one we've ignored for far too long. The second point is I hope people realize that in our own hemisphere there is a regime that is actively supporting and profiting from uh, the trafficking of drugs that ultimately wind up in our streets, that is actively supporting, openly supporting, elements uh, that are uh, both narco-terrorists but also just flat-out terrorists who have killed and maimed not just people in this region but oftentimes Americans. That in this region there is a regime that is an active supporter of, Ira of Iran's nuclear ambitions. Uh, that in this reg region there is a regime surrounded by a level of enablers and cronies who steal all this money from the Venezuelan people, who benefit from access to power in Venezuela and then spend weekends and holidays parading up and down the streets of Miami uh, enjoying their ill-found gains. And uh, so that's why I'm supportive of the bill we passed last year and supportive of the president's decisions. And I hope people realize that all the problems of the world are not in the Middle East. All the problems of the world are not only in Asia or in Europe. There are real and significant problems in our own hemisphere that impact life in America. And the last point I hope people will take away from today is that we believe that the future of Venezuela belongs to the people of Venezuela. In a perfect and ideal world, the world that we're pushing towards, uh, the, the Venezuelan people, through the ballot box, will repla replace these leaders with ones of their own choosing, which will help Venezuela fulfill its destiny as a prosperous, peaceful, and free country. Uh, that's not the direction it's headed in today. And while we cannot mandate the conditions in Venezuela, nor should we try, and it is not our intention to do so, uh, we will certainly should lift our voice anytime human rights are being violated, especially in such a grotesque manner. And we will certainly condemn those who are benefiting and profiting from uh, these abuses, and then coming to our own shores uh, to enjoy those benefits uh, from the money they've stolen from their own people. And last but not least, we cannot ignore, despite the recent opening, the Cuban influence in Venezuela and the role that they're playing. Nicolás Maduro recently said that the United States was planning to invade Venezuela, which anyone familiar with U.S. policy just, think, just knows how absurd it is um, and, and, and how ridiculous a statement that is. But I would say to you that there is an invasion going on in Venezuela, and it's an invasion of Cubans. Uh, 
of Cuban agents and Cuban government officials that have infiltrated the highest levels of its government, who provide personal protection to Nicolás Maduro and Chávez before him, who control the official documents of the government, who are training their sports department, better known as their repressive regime, and, uh, and, and these things are happening as well, and it should give us insight into the true nature of the Cuban government.